just a moment. Recording's on. It's yours, Jasmine. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. We're now really excited to present uh, Naji's living history. So with that, I'll pass it on to Na. Please all take right. it away. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk to you all. So uh, first, this is uh, the boring um, summary of my life, but that's not what I'm here for. So I'm here to tell you about the exciting living history version of it. So I'm going to start from my uh, childhood. I grew up in China to, in a city called Benbu. Uh, as I would tell people outside, you know, I saw China, I would say it's a small city with two million people. And this is a place uh, where my parents meet and uh, raised uh, my sister and, 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 uh, and me. So it's not possible to really talk about my life trajectory without uh, talking about my parents because they are living history kind of defined both the historical and the personal context for my life and for my career. So my dad was born in uh, 1946. When he turned 19 years old, he was admitted to as an undergraduate student to the Department of Physics at Peking University. So at that time, you know, even and now, one of the best universities in China. So he was an excellent student in during his first year studying there. And if life had gone on normally, he would probably become a physicist and maybe he will be talking here today. And I would not have existed. But in 1966, the Cultural Revolution in China started. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but this whole thing lasted for 10 years. Universities stopped instruction and research, and many professors were actually sent to labor camps um, to be re-educated. So, so eventually, you know, my dad is supposed to graduate, and they didn't really get to learn much for the rest of the three years he was there. And when he was graduated, he and his classmates were all sent to a collective farm where they uh, spent one year just uh, planting uh, um, crops. And I guess the unironic uh, consequence of that is that my dad is actually an excellent gardener, um, likely due to this, uh, this practice. So, uh, um, and then by that time, there's actually a shortage of high school teachers uh, across China because too many of them were sent to, to be re-educated. So my dad was sent to assign basically to my city to become a high school uh, teacher. And that's where he met my mom. So uh, when my mom graduated high school, the, the trajectory is uh, the usual path was to be sent to the rural area and become a farmer. But because by then there was also a shortage of elementary school teacher, my mom passed a special exam and got to become an elementary uh, school teacher. They got married. My sister was born in 1976. So why is this year important? Because one year later, China reinstated the college entrance exam. So now ambitious and intelligent people like my mom could go to college and then do something extraordinary with their life. But suddenly not for my mom, because by that time she has an infant at home. So she stayed and she had me uh, one year later. So later on, my dad moved on to a local university and eventually become the provost there. And my mom got her college degree uh, through adult school and then continued teaching elementary school before she retired. But the focus of their life was really on my sister and me. They made sure to emphasize the importance of education without being you know, tiger parents about it. And they also encouraged our curiosity and bought many books for us to read. But I would say probably most importantly, they encourage us um, to go far and fly high, much to the contrary, uh, you know, kind of expect this pervasive societal expectation on girls and women. So speaking of like growing up as a girl in China, I just want to share two stories. Uh, one is about my last name, which is uh, uh, Ji. So the, 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 the surprising thing to many people is that my father's uh, uh, last name is actually Zhang. And traditionally in China, as, as in other country, children take their father's last name. But uh, I didn't, uh, and the story is because uh, uh, my paternal grandparents had four sons, and but they only had, then they had the four sons give them seven granddaughters and only one grandson. And they, this was very disappointing for, for my grandparents because they wanted a son. And my father was the oldest son. So he, they were really wishing him to, to have sons, but my mom gave birth to two girls. 
And this disappointment and displeasure, they, they felt free to share with my mom. And then my mom said, well, if the Zhang family doesn't want girls, the Ji family, my mom's family would claim them. So, and then my dad agreed. So I actually have my mom's last name. And my sister has my has my father's last name. So there you go. So the, the second story, which kind of in retrospect foretold my career path in an unexpected way, uh, happened uh, about right after my college entrance exam. So when I needed to pick the department where I would like to study, I need to basically pick a major. So my first choice was actually biology. But at that time, biology major was super hot. It's my like computer science nowadays. All the students, all the best students want to study biology. And my college entrance exam score wasn't high enough to get me into the biology department. So my second choice was physics, you know, just like what my, what my dad did. So my dad, who is always very, very supportive, but he actually suggested to me to study chemistry instead, because uh, which, you know, in his view, chemistry was easier than physics and more suitable for girls. And this is what he literally said. He said, you know, during his college time, none of the girls in his physics department class did well academically. So I should, I should study chemistry because it's simpler, easier. So the, the final compromise is that uh, I decided to major in chemical physics. So what is chemical physics? I mean, you know, for some of you who are not familiar with, it's basically, you know, the branch of physics that study chemical processes. You know, why it's very similar to biophysics, which is to use physics tools to study biological system, but instead we are studying chemistry system. And it turns out it was a major that I really enjoyed because we got to learn lots of courses, you know, from organic biochemistry all the way to quantum mechanics and solid state physics. So, and then, you know, very quickly I become like the, the top student in my class, have a, had the a highest GPA, but then, you know, I would hear those grumblings from my classmates, oh, she's very good at taking exams. That's what they say. But, you know, anyway, I just move on, keep, you know, getting the highest scores uh, despite of everything. So uh, in my senior year, we have this kind of seminar course where the professors sometimes uh, from outside the university would give us talks about uh, the ongoing research in chemical physics. So I was very much inspired by Professor Fan Ao Kong, who uh, was working in the Institute of Chemistry at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And so I wrote to her, him and asked him whether it would be okay for, him, for me to do one year of undergraduate research in his lab. So he agreed. So I spent one year in Beijing and uh, the projects I work on are quantum chemistry, you know, kind of ab initial calculations of how molecules uh, break apart in very intense electric field. So it was really a wonderful year. And what I learned is that I actually enjoy doing research. And then the second one, probably the more important one is that uh, theoretical computational work is not for me. So, so I decided that I will become an experimentalist later on. So with uh, Professor Gong's recommendation, I was offered a position in chemistry graduate program at UC Berkeley. So we had to choose a group to join within the first uh, two months. I looked around chemistry, but I couldn't really find a, a group that fits me. So, but at that time and also now, Berkeley is a very open place uh, for graduate students to move around. And it was very easy for one student to choose a thesis group that is outside their own graduate program. So I ended up joining Professor Rang Shen's group in the physics department. And I still needed a, a mentor, you know, a nominal mentor in chemistry. And then Professor uh, Rich Sakeney very kindly agreed to be my mentor, fill all the required forms and sign them. And he also hooded me together with Rang at my graduation ceremony. But for my research, I just worked uh, with Rang um, using nonlinear optical spectroscopy to study things like chiral materials, chiral molecules, and we also use it to study water interface. So I learned a lot um, about nonlinear optics from Ram, but uh, I also learned a lot of other things. First is that uh, the importance of working with and learning from really good people. Here I'm not just talking about good physicists or good scientists. I'm also talking about good people who are kind, generous, supportive, and truthful. So my lab mates really, they were my friends, my mentor. They supported me emotionally and scientifically. And even though if you look at the picture on the lower left corner, clearly we did not know how to dress properly to cleaning up 
uh, to clean up a chemical spill. Like you, you show this, people say like, this is what you're doing wrong. Hey, we were physicists, right? So, okay, so the second thing I learned from, from Ron's group is to be really selective of what to work on. You know, there may be obvious project to do, but there's opportunity cost. How would you, how should you spend your time? You need to think very carefully. The third thing is that Ron had extremely high standard on writing papers and giving talks. And he gave us extremely rigorous training on how to do both, which I benefited from uh, throughout my career. And the next thing is that he also always challenges us to reach a very deep understanding, but not by mathematics, but based on a physical picture or physical intuition. And this uh, again, you know, benefited even in my current research. Finally, Ron had a very unique approach to weekly group meetings. Instead of talking about our projects, all we did is to give a general club. We can pick any topic of interest and basically give an overview of that particular scientific research direction. So after five years of this, we had a much more a broader scope compared to a student who uh, you know, may only focus on their own research field. So at the end of my PhD, I had two new realizations. One is that uh, I'm actually pretty good at this. I'm pretty good at doing research, not just uh, you know, getting good scores in exams. And, and then the second thing is that even though I was quite productive, I did not want to continue in my PhD field. I want to do something different. So what would that be? I, I did not know. And Ron was very kind. So he, he gave me a transitional postdoc position and so that I could have the time to actually figure out what to do next. So now looking back at my original interest when I was uh, applying to college, right? I first wanted to do biology, I didn't really get to do it. I wanted to do physics, you know, I didn't do it, but I kind of got into physics anyhow through the back door. Um, so then kind of like, you know, the natural step next is try to do biology, right? And, but of course I don't just live my life to prove other people's wrong. So the real motivation is that after getting my PhD, I had a pretty deep understanding of chemistry and physics of the you know, molecules around me, but I really know very little about biology. And I was very, very attracted by the complexity of the biological system. I feel like, you know, I would not get bored so easily because there's so many unknowns. So, but what kind of biology? I didn't really know, and biology is such a broad field. So I started by reading textbooks. I read molecular cell biology, developmental biology. They were all very interesting, but it just didn't like really kind of, you know, makes me want to spend the rest of my life working on it. But then when I pick up a neurobiology textbook, I was imme immediately uh, hooked. You know, they talk about voltage, current. They talk about free energy. They talk about the emergence of new properties, interaction of neurons. It's very much the language of a physicist. So I decided that uh, I wanted to become a neurobiologist. Now, of course, the problem is that I know nothing about neurobiology. So I started to look for postdocs. And at that time, uh, uh, single molecule biophysics was a very, very hot topic. Many PhDs with my background uh, went on to do a postdoc in single molecule biophysics. So while I was still trying to figure out what I'm going to do with neurobiology, I decided to apply to Steve Chu's lab at Stanford. And he gave me an interview in, in, in Stanford. Now, the problem was that uh, I, I live in Berkeley. I didn't have a car or a driver's license. So, so this guy, Andre, um, um, Rev Yaking at uh, Steve's group offered to give me a ride because he lived in San Francisco. So I took a, a, a BART to San Francisco. He picked me up. And then we were just chatting in the car. And he asked me what kind of biology I was interested in. I told him neurobiology. And he said, well, you should check out this guy, Carol Svoda, from this place which I never heard of called Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And that's where Andre did his PhD. So, so I, I, after the interview, I checked and looked at Carol's paper where he was using this kind of technique called the in vivo two photon fluorescence imaging to look at the synapses in the brain of a living mice. And you can see that synapses will, will appear and disappear when the mouse is undergoing some kind of learning procedure. Now, the two photon fluorescence is a nonlinear optical process. I felt like I had a very deep understanding of the physics involved. And the paper was also written in a way that was very easy to do. So I feel like, oh, I can become a neurobiologist. I just need to go work for this guy. So I con contacted Carol for a postdoc position. 
So he told me number one, he's not looking for, he was not looking for a physicist, which I completely understand. And then, but the second thing he told me was very interesting. He told me that he's, he was moving to a place called Jinilia. I actually heard of Jinilia um, by that time because uh, about uh, one year ago, I uh, read this article in Physics Today about this new research center that Howard Hughes Medical Institute was building. That oh, sorry, is we're running a bit, a bit, a bit behind. So if, if uh... oh, sorry, I'm I'm behind quite a bit. Okay, no, but... it's it's just really fa it's fascinating, yeah. but just <laughs> right. So so okay, so so they're building this institute with a goal of understanding how brands work and using basically optical microscopy. So then I said, well, this is what I can do. And it's also a very intense place uh, based on Jerry's description. And I feel like this is a place that I would really be able to study, um, you know, neurobiology and then to be a neurobiologist. So Carol introduced me to this person called Eric Batsik. And then we decided to address this problem of not being able to see small structures very deeply inside the brain. So we want to work on to, to be able to image deeper into the brain. Now, what was the reason? Without going into details, it's really because this uh, the light got distorted when you image deep into the biological sample. So if we can correct this distortion, then we can image really deep. So what we did, we decided to develop this technique called adaptive optics for optical microscopy. And we had to work very, very hard, and which was great. And this is what I learned from Eric. Work really hard and be, your, be my own harshest critic and don't be a follower, don't just follow what other people do. And finally, think about real impact, what this technique can do for, 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 for science. So I was sufficiently productive that they decided to give me a group leader position where I continued to develop technique, had some fun with uh, discovering biology and got into other way of improving imaging uh, performance in vivo. But this is my, my you know last two slides. So life at Jinina was very comfortable. I didn't have to write grant, but uh, I just got kind of bored because uh, it is uh, the, the surrounding area looks like that. And I was really looking for a place more like Berkeley, more intellectually and culturally diverse. And I want to have opportunity to work with graduate students. I think many of you guys understand there's this energy and idealism that you just can't find. And then finally, I also want to do more than science. You know, we talk about the impact we can do by training students or teaching. And this is something that I feel like at that stage of my career, I want to get into. So, so finally, it was kind of a good move when I decided to, to move to Berkeley because uh, move, moving back to Berkeley because uh, um, very soon, Jinina actually started to move away from focusing on neurobiology. So here I am in Berkeley, and I just want to have a final slide just to get back to my parents. You know, for the first half of my parents' life, they 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 basically you know gave everything to my sister and I to make sure we can pursue our dream. And my sister also become a, a scientist. He's a professor of hydrology at the University of Wyoming. And in the second half of my parents' life, they devoted to make sure that I not only will have a career, but will also be able to have a family. So they help to raise uh, my three children and sometimes uh, a furry friend as well. And you know, people say it takes a village to raise a kid. And in my case, it really takes the uh, love and devotion of my parents to, to bring me where I am in life and work. So thank you, mom and dad, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, for the For the sake of time. Uh, please send all your questions and praise to Nan in the chat, and and we'll move on to the the, the final speaker. <laughs>